Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Knowledge Unlimited. If you haven't already, remember to subscribe to this channel. Today, we are going to talk about incentives and their potential for unintended consequences and failure. Charlie Munger once said, Show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. As one of the most successful investors in modern times, we can assume he knows a thing or two about human behavior. And it is safe to say that incentives are some of the most powerful drivers of human behavior in the real world. An incentive is any mechanism put in place to nudge people into a certain desired behavior. In business, incentives are used at all levels of any company to coax or enforce the desired behavior from the people employed at the company. At the most basic level, your salary is an incentive to do your job. If you don't, you might end up losing your job and, in effect, your salary. Some slightly more advanced examples might be if you or your department show a desired level of sales growth in a year you get a bonus, or the company might prefer negative incentives. For instance, if you are late delivering a certain number of orders as a pizza delivery man, you may be docked in a salary. More on that later. Governments across the world are also using incentives extensively. Taxes are the government's main incentives used to nudge populations in certain directions regarding behavior. Sugar taxes, alcohol taxes, speeding fines, tobacco taxes are all examples of government trying to nudge behavior away from actions that are expensive for society as a whole, as sugar, alcohol, and tobacco are catalysts for diseases that require expensive treatment, while speeding with your car increases the probability for your death. Death is expensive for society if you are a taxpayer. On the opposite side, governments also give positive incentives to people. A common incentive to increase home ownership in society is the ability to deduct interest rate expenses from your tax return or tax reductions on electric cars to make them cheaper compared with cars running on fossil fuels to reduce CO2 emissions. Now that we understand what incentives are and how they work, let's have a look at some examples of when they don't work as intended. Incentives are great if you know what you want to achieve with them and you know how to achieve it. That sounds easy, right? Not so fast. 1. The Cobra Effect The first example are the Cobras of Dali, such a failure that it got its own name, the Cobra Effect. During British rule of India, the British authorities started to worry about the number of venomous cobras in Delhi. The solution? Use incentives. The British offered a bounty for every dead cobra delivered to them. In the beginning, the scheme was a success and a large amount of cobras were killed and handed in for the reward on offer. The city of Delhi became safer, at least with regards to cobras. What the British hadn't accounted for was the Indian entrepreneurial spirit. Unbeknownst to the authorities, entrepreneurs started breeding cobras, eventually killing them for the reward. Once the British learned about the breeding, the reward program were scrapped immediately, and the cobras that were bred were released into the city, increasing the cobra population to even greater levels than it had been before the policy was introduced. So much for incentives, eh? 2. The China Kyoto Scam in the early 90s, the Kyoto Protocol was implemented to reduce climate emissions. In that protocol, there was a mechanism called the Clean Development Mechanism CDM, that was put in place to secure investment in emission reductions in developmental countries. The EU implemented this mechanism in their ETS scheme, regulating climate emissions within the EU, and put in place an opening for the CDM scheme, where any business in the EU required to buy emission rights could swap a certain percentage of their EU assigned emission rights with those coming from the clean development mechanism as they were cheaper to buy and to help the development of less emissions in developing countries. At least that was the idea. China was considered a developing country at that time and could take advantage of the CDM to receive CERs to sell to Europe. The Chinese were street smart enough to spot an opportunity for windfall income and resolutely took action. China, being one of the major emitters of climate gases in the world, were and still are building coal-fired power plants. 
At the time, they decided to build all new plants with an old, dirty technology and then upgrade those plants before they had produced a single megawatt hour of electricity to get access to great amounts of emission rights from the clean development mechanism that could be sold into Europe. As a result, the European market was flooded with cheap emission rights. The price of emitting CO2 went close to zero, and many Chinese project developers got filthy rich. 3. Domino's Pizza In the 1980s, Domino's Pizza promised a pizza in less than 30 minutes. If delivery took longer than 30 minutes, you would get the pizza for free. Unsurprisingly, people started taking advantage of the offer and went to great lengths to get free food. Among the strategies were removing your house number or turning it upside down. And there's more. The delivery drivers were forced to take the brunt of the cost of the free pizzas, so they had every incentive to drive as fast as possible to deliver the orders on time. And guess what? Most of the time, they were short on time and had to bend or break the traffic rules to have a chance of delivering the food on time. And for Domino's, this was a real cost, as they provided the cars that were used for delivery. The cars were run down in record time for huge cost as they were driven recklessly and frequently involved in traffic accidents. In essence, this was a horrible incentive scheme that incentivized customers to cheat and drivers to drive recklessly, inflicting great cost both on the company and on society. The program, which started in 1984, came to its conclusion with a 1993 lawsuit where a St. Louis woman, Jean Kinder, won a $79 million lawsuit against the company after being hit by a pizza delivery car in 1989. 4. The Chinese Dinosaur Bones Late in the 19th century, there was a boom of discovery of dinosaur bones in China. Western paleontologists traveled in mass to China to participate in the new gold rush of fossils and bones. Most of the bones were found in the countryside of China, and to incentivize the peasants to report to paleontologists when they found fossils or bones, they wanted to reward them. What did this reward program look like, you might ask? The peasants were rewarded per dinosaur bone they found and reported. And predictably, this led to a lot of bones being crushed into smaller pieces to get more rewards, but with greatly diminished scientific value. 5. The Soviet Quantities During the 70s and 80s, we all know in retrospect that the Soviet economy was closing in on collapse due to massive inefficiencies due to central planning of the economy. The Soviet steel industry produced 160 million tons of steel by 1980, far more than any country at the time. However, due to the large variety of steel products needed, the economic planners of the Soviet Union decided that the simplest way to measure the performance of the steel mills were to measure the tonnage of steel every factory produced. For the steel producers, the easiest way to optimize tonnage produced were to produce large strips of steel. Unfortunately, there was a greater demand for the thinner varieties of steel. But since every steel producer chose to produce large strips of steel, companies had no choice and accepted the large strips of steel. These had to be machined down to desired thickness and, incredibly enough also, the wasted materials were included in the Soviet GDP at the time. The Soviets didn't just measure the output of raw materials and weight, but also the tonnage of durable goods were the ultimate measure of performance. This in turn led to goods such as cars, refrigerators, and machines being significantly heavier than their western counterparts, with the obvious negative effect on performance and fuel efficiency. In short, the logic of the planned economy was simple. Quantity ruled and the participants in the economy adapted their behavior to the incentives they were given by the authorities. So, how to avoid the cobra effect, you might ask? There are a few ways to avoid the cobra effect. 1. The first step is always to be aware of the possibility that there may be an unexpected side effect to the incentive policy you wish to implement. 2. A second way to avoid the cobra effect is to have a robust test and repeat process for your policies. By continually testing and retesting your policies until you are certain they have the desired effect, you'll be able to spot any potential issues before they become major problems. 3. The third step is to be clear with your instructions. There are a lot of ways that ambiguous language can lead to unintended consequences in surveys. 
so be especially careful here. 4. Finally, apply common sense. Try to put yourself in the boots of the people the incentive policies are designed for. To summarize, the Cobra effect is when a solution to a problem somehow makes the problem worse or even creates a new problems. The simplest thing to do is to make sure that you don't incentivize outcomes that are harmful or detrimental. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you are eager to watch similar videos on a weekly schedule in the future, be careful to press subscribe before you move on to a new video or another web page outside YouTube. Again, thank you for watching.